let me welcome everyone to today's uh, webinar, a, another in a series of Quick Connections online seminars sponsored by University College at the University of Denver. A special thank you to Victoria O'Malley, who's with us today, and all the people at University College that helped make these events pop, uh, possible from week to week. My name's Steve Hick, and I'm a professor of the practice in GIS, and I'm also the director of the GIS certificate program that we offer at University College, and I also direct the Master of Science degree in Geographic Information Science that we offer through the Department of Geography and the Environment at the University of Denver. Just a few housekeeping things that you need to know about, and you've all probably done a millions of Zoom meetings in the last couple months, but uh, this uh, today's session is on understanding GIS, Geographic Information Systems, during COVID-19. Uh, the session is being recorded, so you're welcome to have your camera on. Just know that you may be showing up in the video. Uh, otherwise, you may mute your camera, and your microphone should be muted by default. But then when it comes time for questions and answers, you'll be able to uh, open your microphones and ask questions of our featured speaker today. It's probably best if you save questions for near the end uh, and uh, you can chat them or text them in and we'll be monitoring that so nobody's questions will go unnoticed. And um, before I forget, I should probably invite you to next week's uh, Quick Connection seminar on under or um, uh, on understanding how global is local during COVID-19, hosted by our own Ariana Nowakowski. As a geographer, I, I love the title and I'm looking forward to next week's presentation as well. I want to take a quick second to introduce David Rossi, who is our academic advisor for the GIS program. Uh, David, if you'd like to just say a few words and introduce yourself to the uh, audience. Yeah, sure. Hey, thanks, Steve. And uh, thanks, Joseph, for um, leading this talk. Um, yeah, my name is David. I uh, have been uh, with the GIS program now for nine months as the advisor, and I've gotten a chance to chat with some of you, and some of you uh, maybe I'll be talking to uh, soon enough. We are still um, uh, enrolling students as non-degree seeking for the summer quarter. If you wanted to take a class in GIS, you could certainly try, uh, try one out. Uh, or if you're looking to enroll in the program, you can reach out to me, uh, david.rossi at du.edu, and uh, we can talk about uh, applying to enter into the certificate program, which is uh, a six-course certificate program and a pathway to the master's degree. Uh, we also are excited to announce that in the fall of this year, we are launching uh, four uh, course certificates in GIS um, with a range of uh, uh, applications. We have an environmental applications, a tools and technology application of GIS, uh, UAS, and um, uh, GIS and health. So uh, if, you, if you have a chance to check out our website, please do that. And as always, if you need any support on my end, if you're a student or if you want to talk about the program and your prospective stu student, please reach out. So uh, with that, I'll, I'll kick it back to Steve and, and say thanks to Victoria. Thank you, David. So our, our featured guest today is Dr. Joseph Kursky. And if you are engaged at all in the GIS field, you've heard of Joseph. He's an adjunct professor in our GIS program and has been teaching our public domain data class for many years. And I know he also helps out and teaches at other institutions around the country. He's uh, written several books and papers and has compiled more YouTube videos than I can count on the GIS field. Uh, he's an education, or the education manager at ESRI or ESRI, the world's leading GIS software provider. And without question, Joseph is one of the greatest spokespersons I know uh, speaking on behalf of GIS. And it's a privilege to get to work with him and more importantly, for over 20 years, well over 20 years, I've been able to call Joseph a dear friend. So as we get started, you know, GIS has been around for nearly 60 years, and yet uh, many times we're still explaining what the technology is, what it can do, and who we are as GIS professionals. And I still tell my mom I, I make maps for a living. And she's good with that. And sometimes it takes a disaster or an emergency to bring GIS to the foreground. Uh, you know, it kind of puts it in the news and 
you know, not to be melodramatic, but everybody can remembers 2001 when terrorists struck on U.S. soil, and we scrambled to make maps to understand what had happened and what had to be done, both domestically and abroad. Uh, books were written. Uh, Con Confronting Catastrophe was published right away in 2002 to help us as GIS professionals to think through what we do when we have these sort of events. And in 2005, Hurricane Katrina struck the Gulf Coast and GIS again was in the news as we use GIS to inventory the damage and use uh, the technology to provide supplies to the stranded. Uh, nine years ago today, I was reminded of this reading the paper this morning, a tornado struck Joplin, Missouri, and the regional hospital there, and suddenly GIS again was important for damage assessment and medical services delivery. So those are major events, and here we are now in another one in 2020, COVID-19, a global pandemic touching all of our lives from day to day. And, and I'm sure everyone in the audience has seen the COVID-19 map that was produced uh, by the app and map produced by Johns Hopkins University. And we use that to track. So again, GIS is in the foreground in terms of visualization and spatial data analysis. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Joseph and let him share with uh, our audience uh, what's going on. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thank you, David and Victoria as well. Much appreciated. Well, greetings folks, welcome. Glad you're here. I would like to mention here that all of the all of those things that I'm going to show are available. They're all online, as you can see. They're all in a web browser, and that is indeed one of the uh, one of the themes for this next three hours together. I'm just kidding. We don't have that long, but I just wanted to make sure you were on your toes. But the short time that we have together, I'm going to touch on the whole advent of geographic information systems to the cloud, to a software as a service, and indeed a data as a service entity or framework or structure or platform. It really is a platform that people can build on, and that's one of the things that gives it its power. The other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, Steve touched on this when he talked about our long-term friendship and collaboration. The GIS community is a very giving community. I think you sense that from David as well. We're all about how do we help people make wiser decisions with good tools and good data. That's really the essence of what geotechnologies is in society. And so feel free to reach out to us, uh, um, contact us, link with us on LinkedIn, et cetera. We're here for you. And that's one of the things that has drawn us into education. All of us have uh, connections to the University of Denver. And I love teaching at the University of Denver. And uh, another neat thing about GIS, you can be ageless like Steve Hick. I mean, he looks pretty much the same as he did 25 years ago. So that's another nice aspect to be using GIS. You, 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 you're a life long learner and um, you really do care about people in the planet. The nice thing about modern GIS is that you can be, and I, I know that we have a diversity of, of fields represented here in the attendees and also folks that are going to be watching this online later on. You may be in health, you may be in business, civil engineering, biology, uh, forestry, uh, city planning, etc. You can be in a wide diversity of fields these days and be using geographic technologies effectively. And that's another thing I'm gonna to touch on here. Before I leave this slide though, here's my contact information. And again, I'm happy to get in touch. As Steve mentioned, I've got about 5,000 videos online. I'm very passionate about uh, geographic technologies and geography and uh, education. So if you would like to uh, check out my YouTube channel, it's called Our Earth. And a couple of things that may be of interest, you can see right here on the front, I've got teaching about COVID-19 with an interactive story map and also teaching about COVID-19 with a 3D interactive map, both of which I'll show here at the, uh, at the session uh, today. Steve mentioned this map that millions of people have looked at per hour over the last three months, and that is all enabled, this Johns Hopkins uh, University uh, web map and app uh, and dashboard. We'll talk about what a dashboard is in a bit, but think of this as um, similar to the dashboard in your car. You've got a lot of information in one, basically one panel. That's what a dashboard in geographic technologies is. It gives you a lot of information in a short amount of space. And indeed, that's what's attracted people to mapping for centuries. A lot of information in a short amount of space, whether that space was in the past on clay tablets, wood blocks, and later on 
in film form and then in paper form. My background, uh, just to, uh, to touch on the, the paper form, is uh, as Steve mentioned, uh, I don't teach full time at the University of Denver. I'm an adjunct in the GIS, the wonderful GIS program that he and David run. But most of my background is actually producing the kinds of data that people are consuming now about COVID, about natural hazards, about traffic, about pine beetle infestation, et cetera. Uh, creating data in USGS federal agencies such as NOAA and Census Bureau. And then uh, I've got some ties to nonprofit and then at ESRI, the private mapping company that actually is all concerned about producing the kinds of tools that people can use for this. So back on this, you've seen this, people are consuming it. So we have a really pivotal time in geographic technologies right now where many people now are coming up to people like Steve and David and I and say, oh, I get it. This is what you do. This is what you're so passionate about because they're being bombarded really and consuming and desiring these kinds of data sets at their fingertips so they can make wiser decisions. Ditto for their city managers. Ditto from the, for the US uh, CDC and the World Health Organization, et cetera, right? These tools are not just great tools to be able to uh, get a meaningful career in, and they're not just great things to teach in academic programs like at the University of Denver, but they're actually used to make smarter decisions, and that's why they're produced, and that's why they're consumed. Now, this particular tab that's only been around for about a month or so in the uh, Johns Hopkins uh, site, uh, this tab allows you, and you might check this out, you can actually look at different counties so you can drill down scale matters in geography scale matters and the idea here is that when we look at different counties we get a different pattern that's why we love looking at mapped data because we see patterns relationships and trends and they're fascinating and they also help us to make smarter decisions about the future so if we looked at a county we can see a infographic for that county the infographic in this case is actually made from a geographic technology tool, a GIS tool called Business Analyst Web, which is another part of this web-based software as a service geographic information system technology, specifically arcgis.com, which you see up in the upper left, if you can see the tiny uh, URL that's up there. So the idea is we've got these data sets that live online now. They're data services, originally produced in paper map form, then scanned and digitized and produced as originally a bunch of files that you would have on your computer locally or on your workstation. And that's still there, but increasingly these data sets are online and that gives us the power to produce things like this at pretty much a moment's notice. There's no way way back in the Stone Age when Steve and I started with GIS. Well, maybe the late Cretaceous, right, Steve? Anyway, the point is, there's no way you could have done this with things locked up into individual people's workstations. I mean, think of other sharing tools that you use nowadays. Google Docs, your music is, is online, right? Your docs are on your spreadsheets. Sure, there's still some local files that you have, but if you wanna collaborate and work with others, collaboration is the key to success with complex, global issues that increasingly affect our everyday lives, as Steve was saying. And hence, these tools, these data sets are increasingly being served online by your local government, by private companies, by the Nature Conservancy and other nonprofits, uh, by private companies, et cetera. So there's no shortage of data and the data can be used to create these kinds of information data sets that people are consuming nowadays. And increasingly they're used as a platform to connect to news sources. So for example, you've got a bunch of news sources over here on the right side connected to a dashboard uh, by this company. Okay, different, different company entirely, but people producing, hey, I wanna produce my own information and I'm gonna leverage this platform called Geographic Information Systems to produce data, to tell a story, to get across information to my clients, my board of directors, my customers, or even the general public. So that's the power of mapping in the cloud, geographic information systems in the cloud. It's great that you have your music online. That's cool, anywhere, any device, anytime. It's great that you've got your Google Docs and your Microsoft 365 online, so you can collaborate. But these complex issues that we talked about, whether it's health or biodiversity loss or urban sprawl or water quality or climate or whatever it is, we, we've got to be able to co collaborate across disciplines, right? We need the sociologists and the economists and the business people and the geographers and the planners and all those people collaborating. And we're not gonna get there until, 
uh, we have effective ways to to share data and to share models, to share methods, and that's what this platform allows us to do. Now, no surprise to you all, but many organizations, including my own, and I've got my ESRI badge on right now, but I'm also, as, you, as, as Steve mentioned, I've got some academic uh, uh, toes in the waters as well. But on the ESRI front page, the organization that I am on the education outreach team for, which basically supports faculty, students, administrators, campus facilities, people, deans, etc., in teaching and learning about geographic technologies. Front and center on our page is this uh, COVID-19 support set of documents. So we've got something called a hub that allows people to get components that they can take to Jefferson County, Colorado, to Wyoming, to Belgium, and use those tools with their own and pour their own data into it and then serve it out. So there, there are many tech tools inside this sort of geotechnology tool belt nowadays, and one of them is called this hub technology. More about that in a moment. Let's just step back a moment. Maybe some of you on this call are wondering, well, how does this all work? What is the geographic information systems anyway, and why would I care about it? Well, hopefully I'm making a case for why you should care about it, but just at its, at its um, you know, core basic level, let's say we've got data. Increasingly, we want to be able to consume data that's in real time, not just about COVID, but about what's the stream height in the river down the road from my, from my campus or from, or from my house, what is the wildfire extent right now in the National Forest Fire that's going on maybe down the road from my house? What is the, um, uh, is the situation with you know, X or Y variable? You, you think of things, but increasingly people want that in real time. And we're able to get it from sensor networks, including this whole body from the internet of things, the IOT that's increasingly tied to geographic locations. But just stepping back for, okay, I've got this seamless map of the world. I've got some plate boundaries on it. It's in this ArcGIS Online platform. So a, a one of many manif manifestations of GIS in the cloud. I've got the plate boundaries on there. Okay, great. I've got the earthquakes from the last 30 days. This is from the USGS. So I can see that, oh, okay, there was, a, there was an earthquake a couple weeks ago on the US-Mexico border, and it was got uh, 3.5 in magnitude, et cetera. The G part of ge uh, geographic information systems is this map. It could be a satellite image. It could be a 2D map. It could be a 3D map, but that's the G part. The I part is the data set, the, the table of data behind the G. So in this case, I've got 30 days of earthquakes in real time, two and a half magnitude and above, streamed in from the USGS. It's at, not actually local to my computer. It's actually up on a server. And again, think of the power of that. You don't have to actually download every single one of these data sets anymore. 2,642 in the last 30 days. Wow. So the Earth is really a dynamic planet. Yes. So I can do things like, okay, this is the table of data. So this is the I part of GIS, and this is what really gives it its power. This GIS stuff that you see here is not just a bunch of map, uh, maps and graphics floating around in cyberspace. It actually does have intelligence behind it. It also has something called topology behind it that lets us do things like, how many earthquakes are within 100 miles or 100 kilometers of Denver in the last 30 days? How many earthquakes are within X distance of the plate boundary? How many earthquakes have occurred within Y distance of a power station, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things we can do with geographic information systems. We can use analysis tools like proximity, as I'm talking about here, creating buffers around things. We can, we can enrich data with cloud-based information. I wanna know the population that's impacted by this earthquakes of, of X magnitude, okay? So those are the kinds of things, analysis tools that we can run on our data. But just um, uh, back on the, um, very simple kind of basic stuff with GIS. Let's change this so that we can say, hey, I don't wanna just map the location. I wanna map leveraging what Joseph was talking about with this, these attributes. I wanna map it on magnitude. Okay, so just in you know, keeping in touch with the, the time limitations that I have. Now I've got a magnitude map. Ah, so I can see that not all these earthquakes are created equal in terms of depth or magnitude. I can see some really big earthquakes along the, and you're thinking to yourself, yeah, Joseph, the ring of fire. Exactly. So I've got some deep and large earthquakes in certain parts of the world. And wouldn't it be great if I could change the base map? Oh, yes, I can. I can change it to an ocean's base map so I can look at the Tonga Trench and see how many earthquakes have occurred uh, within X distance of the Tonga Trench. And some of them are quite significant like this one at five. So that's what a GIS is in, in essence. It's the G and the I linked together to be a system. 
And this could be anything. This could be population. This could be uh, p crimes. This could be locations of litter. It, this could be water quality test points, soil test points, um, mountain peaks, 14 years in Colorado, whatever, okay? Now, all I had to do to build this map was to spend a few minutes using this add button. And then I could search for things like biomes and ecoregions and earthquakes and fault lines and plate boundaries. So within a few minutes, you can build a map like this too in this ArcGIS plat platform. But one thing that's, that I'm really passionate about, and I know Steve is too, because he's the one that was behind, uh, the brainchild behind this d data course that uh, he mentioned earlier, but we're both really passionate about getting students and others critical of the data. Now, you don't believe everything you read on the internet, right? You don't, you hopefully don't believe every map that you see on the internet. There's loads of maps on the internet. We're, we're in no shortage of maps these days, right, folks? But we want you to be critical consumers of data, and that's one of the points behind really a lot of the courses at, in DU at the uh, Geographic Information Systems Program. It's getting students to think about who created the data, how often is it updated, all of that sort of thing, um, the scale it was created at and so on, because anybody can create a data set in this platform. There's no data police saying, you can't put that data up here. You can put it up there as long as you provide a little bit of metadata information about the map, the, the map layers, you can put data up there and so can your students and so can anyone. Okay, so that means you need to be even more critical than in the days before web-based GIS. And because of that, I actually have, I know this sounds super boring, but a data blog, oh, oh data, data blog. Well, I can't contain my excitement, but it's really critical to our discussion here, folks, because it's all about how, to, how can I trust the data? Can I trust the data? Okay, so that's what this is all about. And I encourage you to go here, spatial reserves. Just do a search on spatial reserves. Let me say another thing about this blog and some of the things I'm passionate about. I also have in here location privacy, ethics, crowdsourcing, and other societal issues. Do you always say yes when that phone app asks you, do you want to share your location? And if you say yes, does it matter? So things like that, thinking about sharing your location and why that actually is a big deal to uh, people like advertising companies. They want to know your location, not just outside, but inside stores. Where are you spending time? When we actually could go to stores, but the point is inside stores uh, and outside. So that's, that's all wrapped up in here. Let's, let's, um, let's talk about a couple of other things here real briefly in the last remaining minutes that I have. I've got a resource that um, I'm gonna put in the chat box about how you can actually create these web maps, infographics, and dashboards based on the data from the coronavirus as a um, bridge to you learning more about geographic information systems technology. So I'm gonna go to the chat box here and I am going to uh, share this. One of the things that you'll be able to do once you read that, um, that essay of mine is you'll be able to go to ArcGIS online and the University of Denver has an account for ArcGIS and you can create a map like this. So this is a map along with a, this should look familiar, a dashboard. So what I did here was I said, I want to know in this pie chart countries with 10,000 or more deaths. I mean, this is grim stuff, but it's extremely relevant to society. And just to show you how easy this is, look, I'm going to configure this. I'm going to configure this pie chart. Okay, and I say, look, deaths greater than or equal to 10,000. What if I said 50,000? So I can just change this right here, and okay, what about 25,000? You see what I mean? I can just change the, what I'm configuring here and say, okay, done, and now this, I didn't change the title, but now this is 25,000 and over. And I can also change the way that this is classified much in the same way as I changed that earthquake. So here's my map that's tied to the dashboard. What I've got it mapped right now is I've got location only, okay? But if I want to, I can say, you know, I, I wanna look at uh, the number of deaths, sadly, and I've got some options here. Interesting. So in my options, let's turn this off and turn this back on. I've got confirmed and my options under size, this is where we really get into the scale that you choose, the symbols that you choose, the classification method that you choose influences your end user's experience. So in the GIS program, we lay heavy emphasis on symbology, cartography. Steve has always been really solid on cartography, for example, because 
maps are powerful. They're powerful means of communication. And so use them cautiously and wisely as you're communicating whatever it is you're passionate about. You can see right now I've got a nat natural breaks. Maybe I don't want natural breaks. Maybe standard deviation is a better way for me to display this information because a lot of this, for example, as, as you well know, is based on population. And a lot of people don't don't think about the underlying uh, base numbers when they look at something like a health variable. Okay, Colorado, uh, for example, has X number of millions of people, five and a half million people. And so Denver County, Jefferson County, Arapahoe, Douglas, et cetera, are going to have more of just about everything. More crime, more people under 10 years old, more people over 65, uh, et cetera. More educational institutions just because of the base population. So when you look at a map like this, you want to really choose carefully. All right, I'm going to move on here uh, because what I wanted to say was uh, a couple things about these five forces that I think are really important as we move forward in this decade with geographic information systems. Uh, geo awareness, I believe, is at an all time high. So people are aware of the issues that I talked about at the beginning water, crime, health, population change, et cetera. That's actually good for all of us in, in a geo related field. Just tying into the, the high interest that people have in earth related issues. And they're all geographic issues at their heart. They really are. And the enablement of people, as I sort of hinted at, uh, people are enabled to use some sort of geographic technology, whether it's consuming one of these dashboards on the coronavirus or navigating to their local public library or around campus with a map on their phone or looking at a satellite image of a prospective house they want to buy. They're, they're enabled in some way anyway to use some of the geographic technologies, which I think is another good uh, trend. And the geotechnologies themselves having migrated up to this cloud-based environment that I had talked about. Citizen science, ordinary people gathering information on pine beetle infestation, broken sidewalk in my community, whatever it is, weather. And then finally, storytelling. Storytelling with maps. Maps have been used to tell stories for thousands of years, but storytelling with mapped information has never been more accessible and doable than it is right now. This whole presentation that I have right here this one right here that I'm showing you at the moment is a story map. It's a story map, which is another part of this platform. It's a way for you to tell a, a compelling story about uh, an issue. Briefly, I've got about two minutes here. I want to show you a story map that is of a of a um, um, an issue that I'm that I'm really passionate about, and that is walkability. Okay, so here is a sidewalk. Is it walkable? Is it not walkable? It's right next to this big fence. There's some obstructions. There's some trash. There's some snow. Is it truly walkable or not? And so I've got a story map based on that. And I'm just going to show you briefly right now. So this is a multimedia interactive map about a theme. In my case, how walkable is your community? And this will show you the power of linking these geographic technologies together that are all in the cloud. So here is my walkability story map. Um, what is walkability? Why should we care about it? Inside the story map, I actually have a survey. Now you may have used Google Forms or SurveyMonkey in the past to create a survey. And indeed, we are deluged by surveys nowadays, right? You get off the airplane and it's, hey, how was your flight? Wait, I'm, I'm barely off the airplane. You're already asking me. But we're, so we're getting deluged by surveys. So surveys are a pretty common part of our experience. But this, in this case, the survey becomes an editable map layer. And so then you can actually map it and analyze it. So I've got my survey in here, and this is open. Anybody can add to the survey. You could add to my survey because I'm the author of the survey. I haven't closed it off, and I've made it crowdsourced. So anybody can get into it. Is it friendly or unfriendly? Rate the walkability. Tick some choices. Is there great dangerous tr cross traffic, et cetera? Where is it? And then finally, do you have a photograph of it? So inside this story map, I've got, hey, this should look kind of familiar. Here's my data of the surveys that have come back. And if I click on one of these points, right, I'm going to see, in this case, I was down in Australia teaching uh, last fall. And uh, this is pretty walkable. It's a park right next to the Opera House looking over Sydney. Good on you. Uh, so that's the result of my survey. And then finally, below that, this should look pretty familiar too. Here is the dashboard that is connected to my survey that is on the walkability theme. So while this dashboard took me mm, two hours to create, we're not talking days or weeks, two hours, I've got 
this many points. I've, here's my graph about friendly or unfriendly. Here's my attributes, a little legend, a little graphic, and then my live interactive web map. Okay, this took me a few hours, but it's the same tool as the one here from Johns Hopkins, right? The, so the dashboard that they made, which act, incidentally was from two graduate students and a professor initially, pretty cool. So go grad students. But the point is, um, this is the same tool and you have access to these same tools at your fingertips to make maps and stuff like this. Now the point that Steve and I and others uh, frequently make is don't stop at the map. Hey, they'll say to Steve and I, I, I've got my points or my lines or my polygons on a map. And we'll say, great. And the point is not to make maps. The point is to understand something better, deeper, uh, in a richer way. So the map is a tool to help us to understand and therefore make wiser decisions and make plans. But don't stop at the map. So here's an example of a hub that I promised I'd show you in the last remaining minute here. Here's a hub on, uh, that was created by these folks up in a national forest in Alaska and talks about a, a problem that we also have in Colorado too with different kinds of beetles. We have pine beetles more often here, but here's the spruce beetle up there. And so you see some graphs, you see a dashboard, you see something else that I was kind of hinting at earlier. Oh, okay. How do I, community member that I am, engage in this? What can I do? Where can I bring my timber that I've cut from my land, for example, so that these beetles don't spread? So they've got, hey, you can drop it off here. So it's a, a community engagement tool. And this is all created with this ArcGIS hub technology that uh, I'm pretty excited about. And the, the last thing I'll leave you with is uh, I've got a colleague in our ESRI office in Denver that probably, I mean, Steve was very kind about, you know, the words about me being in GIS. I'm just really passionate about this and I'm glad to be a part of the community. But one real hero is Jeremiah Lindemann. He is my colleague at the ESRI in uh, Denver and uh, he created a wellness check solution. What do we mean by solution? So many companies have solutions, plumbing solution, right? The guitar solution. Uh, the point is uh, these are configurable templates that people can just grab and start modifying and using. They don't have to spend weeks, months, years creating their own stuff from scratch that maybe another community or another national forest or another county wants to do the same thing. Why don't we provide these templates that people can start using and then modify for their own needs? So my colleague created this wellness check solution. Hey, I need to, I need to be tested. Where can I go? And then how can I monitor the people? Look, survey one, two, three is part of this solution. How do I manage the volunteers that are going to do this, this kind of work? So this is just two days old, but it just shows you um, here are the maps that you get with this solution. And so people are going to start using this as well. That's the beauty, the wonder, the glory of modern geographic technologies is that they're providing real solutions for people on a ongoing basis that the, this platform actually updates frequently. Um, how do you get into this? How do you get to learn more about this? We can talk about that in the Q&A, but there are no shortages of videos, help files, lessons that you can dig into to start your journey into using geographic technologies. And I just want to say, let's say you're not passionate about being a GIS person, like that's not your main job. You want to be a biologist or a, or a, a, a supply chain management um, marketing person or a manager or a, um, a health medical professional, et cetera. But you want to want to ask the where questions and you want to use geographic technology. So that's, that's the beauty of these things today, in my opinion, is that you can use these, have them on your tool belt, but you can still pursue your main career, but having this uh, as a tool for you and a perspective, because this is really the most important tool, your brain, as a perspective going forward when you ask the where questions. Or if you want to get into this a little bit more, yeah, there are GIS analyst jobs and there will, there will continue to be uh, more and more uh, geographic information systems uh, positions in various uh, sectors of society. So I'll just close it off there and uh, take questions. I hope that was of interest. And, you know, just summing up, this is a really key moment for geographic technologies. I mean, Steve mentioned those other hazards and disasters of the past. I wish it hadn't taken a disaster for people, for example, in the Haiti earthquake to realize, oh yeah, we need ground people that can collect data and serve it up in the cloud. That was really like the first example of, uh, you know, citizen science mapping on large scale to help people in need. Same thing here, we've got a, a key moment, but again, I wish, I wish it hadn't happened. Um, all right, thanks folks.
Uh, but with good tools and good people, I'm, I'm confident that we will, we will emerge on the other side. Thank you very much, Joseph. Um, I haven't seen any questions coming through the chat, but the floor is open for questions because certainly if y'all don't have um, any, I do. <laughs> uh, but here's one that just came in. Are there any thoughts on how to increase accessibility, both knowledge and understanding of these programs and applications like ArcGIS? especially in more at-risk populations which may not experience GIS if they don't have a phone or if they just never had a class on GIS. Yeah, um, okay, so a couple of things that come to mind. I, I kind of hinted at this uh, a bit ago. There are a couple of resources. Now, admittedly, you've got you to have a, a, you know, some sort of digital device to consume, to consume these. We'll talk about uh, how would I do this if I didn't have any of this kind of stuff. But these learn lessons are, you know, hour, two hours long, and it teaches you, hey, how do you build a web mapping application like the one I saw from Joseph? How do you build a dashboard? How do you go out in the field and collect data and then record it in this Survey123 tool? There are lessons that allow you to do that. Uh, we and others uh, have a series of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. So some universities offer these in geographic uh, technologies, remote sensing, GIS, uh, GNSS, GPS, et cetera. Ours are very similar to a university course where you start at a certain time, you go through it as a cohort. They're usually about five or six weeks long. They're free, they're rigorous, they're fun, they have personality. People that teach them actually you know, are engaging. And um, so that's another way for you to kind of step into this. There's one on the coding side of GIS. You know, how do I build the, how do I use JavaScript and Python to build these apps from, from, from code? So I'm really interested in that. Or maybe I'm interested in the remote sensing imagery um, MOOC or data science, uh, for example, or business related one. So those are another, I think, good opportunity um, to, to get into this. The other one that I'll mention is a couple of colleagues and I put together these mapping hour videos uh, about a month ago in response to this current situation. So it's really for parents and teachers. Hey, I I'm teaching online for the first time. What do I do? How do I, how do I engage my students with looking at real world issues from local to global scale? Or I'm a parent. I want my kids to not, you know, to actually engage in doing something meaningful here while they're uh, largely at home. What do, how do I get them into something like this? So this is all for teachers and parents. I know some university professors that are using these too, and they're, they're beefing up a little bit of the, of the instructions that we've got. So each one of these mapping our videos and associated resources, the videos are, as the name implies, 60 minutes long, and there are associated, associated slides and other resources, books and so on, that you can actually um, read in association with the topic that we raise in each one of these hours. So uh, I hope that's uh, of use. By the way, this whole mapping hour zone, it's a hub, as you can see in the uh, upper left here. So we made a hub because it's a convenient way of um, sharing information. So I hope How that's- How accessible are, thing, are tools like hub and story maps? And, and well, let me preface that by saying, um, if you're affiliated with the University of Denver, all you have to do is go to this link that I am going to. 1 800 ask Steve. Yeah, no, it's not like really that. Like uh, du.edu slash GIS, and everything you need to know about accessing all these tools, uh, getting to ArcGIS Online, where it's sort of the portal to get to all these tools. Everything you've seen today is um, we have, it's all there. And if you're not a part of the DU community, uh, maybe at, at another institution or a school, uh, Denver Public Schools, for example, have access to these same tools uh, to work with. And, and, and if you can get online, if you can get to a library, uh, if you have a smartphone, you can get to these tools. And it's, many are available and you can have a, a free account uh, through Esri. And so, and I'll let you, Joseph, pick up with what can I with a free uh, personal account do uh, in terms of this technology? Yeah, absolutely. Good, good segue there. Um, one way is to go to the develop, this developer account and I'm going to log out. I've actually logged in here. So let's say I sign out. So this is the page that you would see. Developers.arcgis.com. On the left side there, sign up for free. This will give you access to ArcGIS Online, so you can build like that earthquake map I showed, 
the dashboard, um, the survey one, two, three with my walkability map and dashboard. You can build all of those things. You can build a story map like the, uh, did I show any story maps? Yeah, the, the story map of the five themes that I, that I showed earlier. So you can build all of that with this free account. Now it, it does have a certain limitation on the amount of data you can crunch. So you can't geocode or map every Starbucks in North America. You can't map every water well in Texas, uh, you know, but you've got enough capa capability there to really go far. So that's another way if you're not at a school or like, a, like Steve said, at a university like the University of Denver and you really want to start digging into this, how do you do that? Now that mapping hour video um, uh, series and resources that I said, uh, there's another way. If you go to the mapping hour site, you can get an account that way. So there's a variety of ways to get a non-university, non-school account, just if you're a, a general public person and you just want to share this with your, you know, your, your, your uncle or, you know, your mother-in-law or whatever, whoever it is, um, to have them kind of dip some toes into the waters and start with something fun. Hey, cool places I've been to last summer when we were traveling, okay? And, and start, with, start there, some, start with something interesting to you. And then you're sort of learning about some of the tools as well. And then if, like I was saying, if you go into any field nowadays, there, you're gonna be encountering some of these geographic technologies. So uh, for example, there's a history professor at the University of Denver who loves GIS. And, and, and there's people in international relations and civil engineering and elsewhere, so, yep. It, it all moves so fast. I, as we're sitting here, I get an email from the law school asking about the GIS. So uh, it, it's, it's everywhere. And so, yes, you all have tech, access to this. And, you know, you, what you were saying about, you know, start with a fun story. And I was thinking, well, you know, bringing this back to COVID and, and I see some of the, Jeremiah in the last two days apparently has already brought to four, I mean, I didn't know that. And, and you know, for everybody, this just moves so fast and these things can be brought up online so fast. So I'll take that uh, idea off the table, but you know, everybody's gonna have their own personal stories to tell uh, after with uh, sheltering in place. And here you have a great way to do that. And you know, some of you that know me know that I have a background in crime mapping and analysis. And I, I see, oh, we should map all the bad things, all the, uh, you know, the, the, the people that aren't wearing a mask, the locations of the people that aren't wearing a mask or where restaurants may not be in compliance or whatever. You know, that's sort of the negative side, but there's the positive side too. Hey folks, where can we go to have a, a, a safe and healthy experience? And, and the tools are here that we could build this and by tomorrow morning we're online and everything and people were sharing information. Yeah, very well said. So, you know, that said, uh, I would just like to mention again that the DU program is very thoughtful, led by Steve and David, that, hey, these are the courses that we need to teach now to prepare people for the 2020s. As Steve mentioned, this is a very rapidly changing field, and uh, it's very relevant. It's a technology that you can feel good about because it's being used not just in these situations we've talked about, but by the Jane Goodall Elephant Foundation and the Nature Conservancy. I mean, Habitat for Humanity. I mean, these are all organizations that use this stuff. So it's one of those things that you can really feel like, you know, this is a, a, a technology for good. Absolutely. I just had one quick question here. I'm just curious about the risks to citizen science and crowdsourcing data and how do you ensure accuracy with that? Well, you want to start with that, Steve, and I'll, 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 it may, I may add something, but. Well, you know, that, that that's a risk. And, and Joseph made the comment early on about, you know, being a critical consumer of this information. And, you know, I, I, you know, I left Haiti out of my list of disasters early on, and I was in the Caribbean when that happened. Um, mm. And it's, um, you know, you, you, I, I'm, I trust people to be, you know, if you're going to, if you have the wherewithal to share data, then we have to trust people to do it right. And when we see the, the, the COVID reporting, you know, we, we have to trust the medical community. So, you know, it's, I'm, I'm glossing over it, you know, but I think there is a certain level of trust amongst uh, GIS professionals, geographers, GPS surveyors. Uh, we have ethics. We all, we, most of us are GISPs, GIS certified professionals, and we sign an ethics document. But yeah, in terms of citizen science, um, you know, it's beyond the scope of this conversation, but 
we have the statistical tools to look for the bad data, the outliers, the things that don't belong. So if we have to take it to that level, we certainly can. Yeah, and like Steve's saying, uh, any technology can be used uh, for good and for ill. And uh, overwhelmingly, geographic technologies are being used to benefit the planet. This, as you saw me pull up here with my earthquake map, I just changed the base map to open street map. This is an example of citizen science in action. So, you know, zooming to the DU campus, um, if someone, it's kind of like Wikipedia in a sense, if someone finds a new street or something that's not correct, they, they can submit, hey, this isn't right. And the community, I don't know if you've ever written for Wikipedia, I've got a couple of articles there, but really rapidly said, Joseph, you need to fill in this. This is not quite filled in enough. Or can you expand on, so OpenStreetMap is, uh, you know, it, we've, got a, we've got national mapping agencies in many parts of the world, but other places don't have them. And the reason I think in part why, why things like OpenStreetMap are so valuable is that it's filling in, uh, in this case, streets, buildings, other infrastructure, where there was no mapping agency and cities and other people needed that needed that base data or else the national mapping agency uh, sold the data or licensed it so ordinary folks didn't have access to it so things like this are really meeting the needs of people so citizen science like open street map wasn't just invented just because it's a neat thing to look at it was it was created because people needed the data because 10 years ago when i was in the caribbean and the trinidad and tobago we did not have a street map to map crime against and through uh, the effort of the schools and students there, every mm. street is now mapped. And this data is vetted. So I can't speak to, for Joseph, but I, years ago, got approved uh, to submit data to Google Earth and to the USGS national map. So just because I submit something doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be accepted into the system. So you just can't throw bad data at Google, there are people checking it. Yeah, not to say that all of this stuff is perfect, right? Even though there are people checking it, you know, maps, again, you know, be critical of map data. Maps ha are imperfect. They have projection issues. They have uh, spatial accuracy issues. They have incomplete uh, metadata. They have incomplete uh, fields. That doesn't mean, though, that they shouldn't be used and consumed and um, uh, uh, used in analysis. But yes, always, always realize that uh, uh, maps are imperfect representations of reality, very useful representations, but imperfect. But I'm glad you folks are bringing up this, uh, you know, access to the GIS tools, I think is a really good point. Uh, and then also uh, citizen science and data quality issues, for sure. Well, if there are no further questions, uh, one, I want to thank Joseph very, very much from the bottom of my heart. You know, uh, love uh, having you uh, engaged in our program and thank you for everything you do in the GIS community. Uh, you know, if, if you all want to learn about GIS and, and go get on YouTube and watch some of those videos, I can't tell you how much I've learned. And um, so thank you, Joseph. Thank you, David, for uh, what you do for the program and being the interface to students and potential students. Victoria, thank you for putting this uh, on today and arranging these things. And again, I invite you all to next week's uh, presentation as well, uh, so sort of from a global perspective. And, um, you know, again, for those of you, and I do recognize some names here, if you're affiliated with the university and if you get just an ounce of inspiration here, the tools are here. Use them, build on them. Uh, you can do this. This is fun, fun stuff. And it's so much easier than 30 years ago when Joseph and I were chained to digitizing tables. And we, where'd all that digital data come from? Well, we drew it <laughs> back in the day. So with that, Victoria, is there anything else that needs to be said? No, I think that wraps it up. Thanks so much to everyone for being involved. All right. Well, you all have a good, safe, and healthy uh, holiday weekend. Uh, remember our veterans. Remember those who gave their lives uh, so we may celebrate the freedoms that we have. Even though the freedoms may not seem like it at the time, uh, we're still in pretty good shape. So with that, I will uh, say goodbye and thank you again. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, David. Thanks, Victoria. See you all. Map on.